responsible, really. Thank you. We have our last presentation now, and it is Andrea Voitnot, also coming to us from a different area of the state, so Texas. Andrea was previously in New York working at Mount Sinai, working on uh, mice models. We saw fish and now mice, and Andrea is working on those mice to try and develop gene therapy. Now, that's something that we often talk about. Is it science fiction? Is it possible? Well, now we're going to hear about that. And maybe it's worth saying, Andrea, that you were funded to come and visit us in France. Sorry, I can't hear. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I I was just saying that I think this is my fourth DDX3X conference, first international one. Um, I really enjoy coming and meeting all the families. It brings a lot of purpose and meaning to my work. Um, so I really appreciate uh, you all being here and listening and um, learning about uh, DDX3X syndrome biologically and uh, in the future, hopefully therapeutically. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my uh, dissertation work um, on developing a gene therapy for DDX3X syndrome. Um, okay, so uh, gene therapy is kind of an umbrella term for our, uh, any kind of therapeutic that modulates gene expression. So this can include gene editing, which um, you may have heard of CRISPR, that's a hot topic in the field that is considered a gene editing approach. There's also gene silencing. Gene silencing is really good for uh, mutations that are dominant negative, so they cause an altered function, um, but it's not really a, a beneficial approach for DDX3X. Um, for DDX3X, we're taking the third gene therapy approach. This is called gene replacement. Um, gene uh, replacement, uh, Gene replacement um, is a gene therapy where you're introducing a working copy of a gene into cells. It's really good for loss of function mutations or mutations that are non-functional um, because what is happening is you have a cell with a mutated gene. So in this case, it's going to be DDX3X that causes that cell to not function properly. But um, when we introduce a healthy copy of that gene into the cell, it will conceivably make up for the bad copy um, and, and cause the cell, cell to function, function properly. properly. So, so this is what we call gene replacement. replacement. Um, it, uh, is it is the, the uh, approach, approach that we're that taking, taking for DDX3X DDX syndrome. Um, it's not that simple though uh, in developing a gene therapy. It actually takes multiple years and a lot of resources. Uh, it first starts with gene discovery. Uh, so we have discovered DDX3X to cause a neurodevelopmental disorder. Because it's monogenic, meaning it's caused by mutations in a single gene, gene therapy is an approach that uh, may be useful um, because we can package a healthy copy of that single gene uh, and deliver it into cells um, and hopefully uh, have a therapeutic benefit. So once we have the gene, in this case DDX3X, then we can go to develop a gene therapy construct or a gene therapy vector. Um, and produce that vector. Uh, once we have that gene therapy, um, we can test it preclinically in animal models and cellular models to look for efficacy and safety. Um, and then uh, if that data looks good, then we can go to the regulatory agencies and seek approval for a clinical trial. Um, however, a lot of times uh, research gets stuck in this preclinical efficacy and safety phase because the therapy isn't uh, as beneficial or um, shows some kind of safety concern. So a lot of times you have to go back to the drawing board, redesign the therapeutic, and then retest it in uh, cell and animal models before it can go into a clinical trial. Um, so I'm going to talk about how, um, where we are uh, in developing this throughout the talk. Um, but uh, you might be wondering how we get the gene into cells. 
Uh, for the gene replacement approach, uh, we use viral vectors. Um, so they are, you can think of them as delivery vehicles. You have a functional gene. Um, this is would be the healthy copy of DDX3X. We package it into a virus. Um, and then that virus acts as a delivery vehicle, brings the gene into the appropriate um, parts of the body, cells and tissues. Um, the virus that we use is called adeno-associated virus, or AAV. This is the structure of AAV uh, molecularly that you can see here. Uh, it is non-pathogenic, so that means it is safe and does not cause disease, uh, and we can use that as our delivery vehicle. So um, AAV-mediated gene therapy has been um, successfully translated into the clinic uh, for neurological disease specifically. So this is um, an example of a uh, disease called um, aromatic L amino acid decarboxylase deficiency or AABC defic deficiency. Um, it's a neurological disorder um, and with an AAV injection to the, uh, I can first show you what, you'll see the patient at baseline, but um, while that video is showing, um, you can see the, uh, that they in, um, injected the gene therapy specifically into a brain region that is known to cause um, the disease phenotypes. Um, and this gene therapy has a healthy copy of the AADC um, gene. And after the patient has received the gene therapy, you can see that before the patient had um, a lot of uh, issues with um, movement, especially hypotonia. Um, with the gene therapy, she's able to roll over, uh, move her limbs, uh, and even sit up. So this can be a very transformative therapy for uh, specific um, syndromes, um, and hopefully will be an approach that we can use for DDX3X. The caveat here is that uh, this therapy only targets one brain region. So um, here, they knew that um, the this specific brain region called the putamen was um, involved with the phenotypes. So they were able to do a direct injection. But for DDX3X, uh, the gene is in all cells, all tissues. We want to have a global administration and specific administration to the brain and, and spinal cord, um, which is driving phenotype. So... In the gray lab, this is the lab that I am um, working in as, as a PhD student, uh, our, our aim is to develop gene therapies that treat the whole brain um, and central nervous system. So we do this by using two different uh, approaches. One, um, we use a specific type of AV, that's called AV9. Um, this is uh, really good at transducing neurons uh, and nerve cells. And then uh, we also use specific routes of administration that help target the brain and spinal cord. Um, so in the video I showed before with the AADC um, gene therapy, that was an interparenchymal injection into a specific brain region. It only targets that brain region. Uh, but the approaches that we're using in the lab um, for routes of administration include an intracerebral ventricular injection. So that's into the ventricles of the brain. Uh, or a lumbar intrathecal injection. This would be equivalent to a spinal tap um, so that the therapeutic gets into this cerebral spinal fluid can, um, and can get distributed throughout the central nervous system. Okay, so let's get into DDX3X. Um, we study uh, multiple uh, diseases in the lab. Um, all of them are neurologic, and we chose DDX3X uh, as a potential target um, for numerous reasons, one of which uh, is because um, many of the patients have lo known loss of function mutations. Um, so it's a good approach for a gene replacement where you're introducing a healthy copy uh, into cells. We also know that DDX3X has roles after birth. So intervening um, after birth in, in, with kids um, may be relevant because DDX3X has a role. Although um, we don't know how much damage is done during embryonic development. So we don't know how much we can rescue postnatally. And that's one of the questions that we are um, we are looking into. DX3X is ubiquitously expressed. So that's in all tissues and all cell types. 
for gene therapy, um, we are sometimes worried about off-target toxicity. Um, and with DGX3X being in all cells, uh, this is actually an advantage because uh, we would not um, expect as much uh, possible cellular um, or tissue toxicity. Uh, and gene, the gene, DDX3X gene, fits in the AAV capsid. Um, and we have a really strong patient community that's uh, prepared for clinical trials. Uh, so we gave it our best shot. We developed a, uh, we designed a gene therapy vector where we have um, included a human DDX3X gene um, that is driven by a weak and ubiquitous promoter. We packaged that into AAV9, uh, and we've been testing this uh, viral vector gene therapy preclinically. So here I'm showing um, the AAV9 DDX3X gene therapy in the mouse brain. Um, this is from, so just looking at these uh, images, this is a side view of the mouse cut in half. Um, if you cut it straight down in the middle, um, this is the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. Um, and you can see uh, the expression of the AV9 DX3X gene therapy throughout the brain, especially in this region here, which is the cortex, some subcortical regions, and the hippocampus, really important for learning and memory. Um, but it is throughout the brain, uh, just to a lesser extent. So uh, this is the distribution, um, three weeks uh, post-injection. Um, and you can see that we're targeting uh, brain regions that we would want for this disease. We designed a preclinical safety and efficacy study uh, using mice. Uh, mice are used in um, biomedical research uh, to help us understand if there's a behavioral um, therapeutic rescue or not, um, which can help uh, when we look for regulatory approval uh, for a clinical trial. Um, so we have a mouse model of DDX3X. This was developed and characterized in Sylvia de Rubais' lab at Mount Sinai. Um, and we're using it uh, at uh, UT Southwestern um, to test our gene therapy. So this mouse um, has very similar phenotypes to what you see in humans. They have developmental delays um, in physical, motor, and sensory milestones um, and have uh, phenotypes like anxiety, and movement disorders uh, that we can um, uh, extrapolate to human disease. So we uh, injected the DX3X mice um, along with controls uh, with a ventricular injection with either a uh, vehicle control or a low or a higher dose of the gene therapy. And um, we looked at both safety and efficacy. So for the safety, um, this is a full year study and we're just looking for global abnormalities uh, and um, then uh, doing a full uh, tissue analysis to look for any toxicity. Um, for the efficacy study, this is all on behavior readouts. So we assess because this is a neurodevelopmental disorder, we wanna look throughout the um, age span of the mouse. So we start behavior testing uh, in the pups, um, so at postnatal day one, one day after birth, um, for the first three weeks, this is childhood, early adolescence, um, and then assess at three months, this is at the adult stage, um, and a, again, later at 12 months, um, also adult. Um, and we're looking at different behavior uh, readouts, including anxiety and, and motor function. Okay, so just to talk about the um, early results from the early age efficacy. So uh, like I said, we have a mouse model with um, a bit of a lot, but with physical uh, dif differences between controls, motor deficits and sensory deficits. So the DDX3X pup um, is delayed in all of these um, tasks. For example, one of the motor milestones that we do um, is surface riding. This is just the amount of time it takes the pup to um, turn over from its back to its paws. So rolling, being able to roll over. Um, auditory startle is just the response to an auditory stimulus. So we're getting at the sensory, sensory development, sensory milestones. Um, so these are some of the tasks that we run. 
uh, and we have significant differences between our DDX3X mice and our control mice. Um, but when we looked to see if the gene therapy had any benefit, we did not see anything. So with the low dose or the higher dose, we did not see any rescue in um, the delayed behavior. Additionally, we looked in the control mice to see if there were any safety concerns um, with the gene therapy. We also did not see any differences between the um, injected mice and the control, not a vehicle injected mice, um, suggestive that this treatment uh, behaviorally is safe, but it's not efficacious. Uh, at three months, this is at the adult time points. I'm just going to show you some uh, an anxiety um, test that we run. Uh, this is called the open field test. Uh, think of it like you're in an elevator, um, and you have uh, the wall, the outside of the elevator, and the inside of the elevator. You're more like when you walk into the elevator, you're more likely to stand at the periphery, not at the middle, because the middle is a little bit more anxiety, stressful, pr provoking. Um, so we can kind of do this. This is like a thigmo, it's called thigmotaxis, and we can assess this in the mice. So you assess the amount of time they spend at the periphery or in the center of a new environment, of a novel environment. So um, here, if you have the less time that you spent in the center is more anxious. So we have our DDX3X mouse in red and our control mouse in blue, and the DDX3X mice spend significantly less time in the center of the open field, indicative of increased anxiety. When we introduce the gene therapy at the low or the higher dose, we do see a dose-dependent um, amelioration in anxiety. This is significant, uh, where the higher dose does lead to less significant anxiety phenotype. Um, but it is still not to the level of controls. So it is not a full rescue. It is only a partial amelioration. Um, with the low and the higher dose uh, in the control mice, interestingly saw, interestingly saw um, a dose-dependent toxicity uh, where the DDX3X mice um, injected with the control, sorry, the control mice injected with the higher dose actually have increased anxiety. So what this is telling us is that while we can modulate the behavior in mice with a gene therapy approach, we need to be really careful about overexpressing DDX3X because overexpressing DDX3X can also cause phenotype. Um, so what have we learned from this data so far? Uh, one is that there is minimal efficacy with our AAV9 DDX3X gene therapy. Um, we did see this anxiety amelioration uh, in DDX3X uh, at the adult stage, uh, but it was not also not sustained at 12 months. Um, and then the there was no effect in developmental milestones. Um, and then we also have possible changes with overexpressing DDX3X um, that I, I explained earlier. Um, but we did show that the behavior of mice can be modulated um, by altering DDX3X expression uh, postnatally. So uh, it's still worth pursuing gene therapy as a, a potential therapeutic strategy. We just need to get more creative with our therapeutic design. Um, so back to our uh, initial schematic, we are back here where we tried a gene therapy that we gave a best shot at designing, but we don't really see much efficacy and potentially some safety concerns. So we're back here uh, redesigning the gene therapy you know, to come up with a better uh, strategy to then um, test in our cell and animal models. Um, to redesign this therapeutic, uh, we're taking numerous approaches because we don't have enough information to know why this gene therapy didn't work. We have a speculative um, possibilities, but nothing um, that we're certain of. So it's possible that we are intervening too late, um, where there was already too much damage done um, early or before we inject or introduce the therapeutic. Um, so one thing that we're doing is developing a new mouse model to test the time points 
of a therapeutic intervention and when that would be effective. Uh, it's also possible that there's um, a certain amount of DVX to X that's toxic. So we're designing new vectors that have um, that uh, express DVX to X more strongly with uh, stronger promoters um, driving overexpression to understand what that is uh, causing. Um, the third possibility is that we're targeting the wrong t cells or not enough cells um, with the viral vector that we currently have. Uh, so we can work um, on testing new routes of administration uh, and when new viral vectors are developed, those new viral vectors. Um, I'm just gonna talk about the first um, point here uh, for the remainder of my talk where um, we've developed a new uh, mouse model for DDX3X. Um, this mouse model, we genetically inserted a stop sequence uh, into the DDX3X gene, but this stop sequence is in the reverse direction. So when the gene is read, it doesn't read the stop, it reads the gene correctly. So the, the DDX3X gene is on and functioning normally. This is our um, DDX3X flex mouse that's um, depicted here. Uh, when we um, cross this mouse with a male with uh, a, a Cre driver line, so this is an enzyme that interacts with some uh, genetic uh, sequences that we can insert, we can um, develop the DDX3X uh, mouse um, because this uh, enzyme, this Cre enzyme, um, flips the stop cassette into the correct reading direction. So now we have a gene where the stop cassette is working um, and DDX3X is non-functional. So we have our DDX3X mouse. So this is the mouse modeling human patients with a non-functional DDX3X gene. But with our genetic approaches, we've also included a few other sequences where um, the sequence is um, responsive to something called tamoxifen. It's a compound. Um, and with that compound, uh, the stop cassette is fully removed. So now our DDX3X gene is read properly again. So we have DDX3X back on functioning normally. This would not work in humans because the tamoxifen um, compound is specifically targeting the genes, the sequence of DNA that we inserted with our stop cassette to re-express DDX3X. Um, I'm just gonna go over this in more simple terms. So what we have is a mouse where DDX3X is off. Um, it's a non-functional DDX3X. This is uh, modeling patients, but then we can introduce a compound called tamoxifen to re-express uh, re DDX3X and cause normal functioning of DDX3X. And we can introduce tamoxifen whenever we want. Um, so we can introduce that at infancy, early childhood, adolescence, or adult. And then we can see on the behavior readouts that we have, how much is actually rescued at what time point when we intervene. Um, so this mouse model also had to be characterized. It was characterized and has a very similar phenotype to the mouse model at Mount Sinai that we were, used, we were using in the gene therapy study that I talked about earlier. Um, it has uh, motor deficits that we are um, looking at, at closely because they're similar to um, the patients. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of that, but uh, the next steps here are to inject the mice with tamoxifen at the different ages and then assessing um, behavior as adults uh, to see what we have rescued and when. Um, and this is really important uh, for any therapeutic, not just gene therapy. Um, because uh, it will help us understand if there's a window of intervention that is required uh, or not. Um, and that is all I wanted to uh, discuss, but I'm happy to take questions. I hope um, you are able to follow some of the gene therapy work because it is very complicated. Uh, and our team is very large. Um, we have, this is Stephen Gray, this is my PI um, at UT Southwestern. Um, he's driving all of this work on gene therapy development for uh, for pediatric neurological conditions. Uh, we work on over 10 conditions um, from the preclinical aspects to clinical uh, trials. 
Um, and uh, I've been working with um, Shen Yuhi and Angela uh, on the DDX 3X project. So I can take questions. <clears throat> merci, merci beaucoup, Andrea. Thanks a lot, Andrea, for this wonderful Thank talk. Thank you, Andrea.